National Art Education Association Museum Education Division Peer-to-Peer -peer Initiative. Today we are focusing on um, how a book, Teaching in the Art Museum, and its implications for our practice within the museum, and we're joined by colleagues from the Milwaukee Museum of Art. So I'm Michelle Groey. I'm a member of the NAEA Museum Education Division's uh, development committee, which works together to provide opportunities for members, both at the annual convention that takes place each spring, but also ongoing um, resources where we can exchange ideas. And peer-to-peer -peer initiative grew out of a, a question by members looking for more of those opportunities over the web. Um, so we have a series of six hangouts. The first one took place last Tuesday, and the video is available online on our Google Plus page. This um, hangout will be available after our broadcast as well. And just a few quick reminders. You will see um, there's three of us that are presenting or are available on video. The rest of you are watching it as a hangout on air. We would love to hear your voice and hear your questions as well. So if you look on um, at the bottom of the video feed, you can see um, a dialog box where you can type in questions or even pose different ideas or share your own experiences. We're really looking for this to be as interactive as possible and we really value your, vo your voice and would like to hear it. So please chime in and ask questions um, and comments as we go along. And you'll notice as the questions pop up um, in the feed, you can go and, and click plus one, which is basically like giving it a thumbs up or liking it and indicating that you would also like to hear the answer to that question. So the more that um, we get plus ones for certain questions, that'll help raise it up in the queue and um, our presenters will be able to address them in that manner. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our colleagues from the Milwaukee Art Museum. So Amy. Thanks, Michelle. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Amy Kirschke, Director of Adult, Docent, and School Programs here at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And I'm joined by Bridget Globensky, who is our Senior Director of Education and Public Programs. Uh, the person you do not see today, unfortunately, Chelsea Kelly, our Manager of Digital Learning, is out uh, with a, a sickness that took her voice. So she is home resting, and hello, Chelsea, if you're watching. But she was originally going to be part of the conversation, and I'm sorry she's not with us today. So we're all at the same institution, but um, we really have been thinking a lot about uh, the teaching of Rika Burnham and Elliot Kaiki, as well as this book. And that prompted us to submit a proposal to the 2014 convention um, to present on how we've each sort of adapted the teachings of Rika Burnham and Elliot and um, think about it across our department. And we thought this was a great opportunity with this new peer-to-peer -peer initiative to sort of do a presentation of work, our work done to date and really hear from all of you to get some feedback, some questions and comments that will help better inform and shape our presentation for March. And that means for once we'll be done ahead of time in preparation for our convention, which is always great. So I think as a department we've really been fortunate in that we've worked with Rika in particular but also Elliot for many years. Um, we all attended time at some point, the three of us, and we actually are known in the field for having the one docent who snuck into time originally in 2005 when it started. Jane Fee, one of our docents, was uh, attended the very first time program, which for those of you who don't know is the Teaching and Museum Education Program at the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, from which many years of teaching grew uh, the book that we're talking about today, Teaching in the Art Museum Interpretation as Experience. Uh, in addition to that, I attended in 2008 Bridget in 2009, Chelsea I believe in 2011, and Rika has also come and done uh, on-site presentations and gallery workshops a couple of times. So as a result of all this exposure to Rika and Elliot's ideas about teaching in the galleries, uh, we've really had a chance to incorporate dialogical interpretation and long looking into our programs. And all three of us have used long looking in our various programs with visitors, members, docents, and teens. So now that we're thinking about um, this newer book, I guess it's out for two years now, in 2011, when the book came out, in a sense it really started to formalize um, and provide a text. And so we were looking at that as it can be, can it be a text that we have used more broadly and uh, how do we respond to it. And I guess our goal today then really is to share what we've done to date and to 
um, get your feedback, which I think will be so helpful as we plan our presentation. So first of all, I'm, I'm hoping most people are familiar with the book. If not, again, I'll hold it. I love holding this up. I can. Um, it is a series of essays, and each essay stands alone. They, they're great essays, like questioning the use of questions, um, the gallery teaching is guided interpretation, conversation, discussion, and dialogue. But of course, they all build on each other as well into a cohesive uh, whole. Now, I know Rika and Elliot claim that they, this does not constitute a methodology, but I thought it was helpful to read it the note from the preface in which they really invite all of us as museum educators to carry this forward and to adapt and ex extend their ideas. And I'll just read that as it really frames what we're trying to do in our presentation in March. So they say, these essays represent the fruits of our endeavors to understand the heart of teaching in the art museum and to answer the following questions. What happens when we bring people and works of art together in the galleries? of our museum through our teaching? What do we want to happen? And what are the most effective ways to make or to allow this to happen? Our answers to these questions will, we hope, prove valuable in themselves, but their greater value will lie in the dialogue we hope to provoke within our field, and above all, in the experiences of our readers as they test, challenge, adapt, and extend our ideas in their own gallery teaching. So there they've laid it out for us, that they feel that the most important is that we as readers test, challenge, adapt, and extend their ideas. So that's what we hope we've been doing in Milwaukee, and we're excited to share with you, and excited to hear how you are also maybe um, extending these ideas, the questions or challenges you're facing as you do so. So the order we'll do this in is I will first talk a little bit my experience, about my experience working with our docents. Bridget will step in for Chelsea on her behalf, talk about uh, her work with the teens. And then Bridget will also, I'm sure, chime in on um, her role as director of the department and how we, uh, we've thought about this across the department. So to give you a quick sense of what our docent program is comprised of, we have 180 active docents. And each year, I have a new class of 25. They spend their first year doing two days of training a week from September to June. And then after their initial training year, they come to ongoing education one day a week on Thursdays. They are expected to give tours for all ages, adults and children, uh, but the vast majority of their time is spent with school-aged children. They um, are expected, like many of docents around the country, to deliver a huge menu of themed tours. We have a whole booklet that aligns with curriculum standards, so we have themes like American history, world communities, um, we have literacy and art, we have weather and art, and everything in between. So there's always clear goals and objectives in those tours. Um, we also have a unique situation in that we have had the same educator uh, up until this year for 50 years lead our docent core. It's an unusual situation, but we've had Barbara Brownlee at the helm. Uh, she started here 50 years ago and really created a wonderful culture amongst the docents. You can see her on YouTube. If you haven't caught her before, just look up Barbara Brownlee from Milwaukee. But I think what she did is really instill a love of storytelling and a really um, fun approach to art. So we, in some ways, we were, we were half, halfway through the battle, I should say, or we, were, we had a wonderful groundwork laid in that we were encouraged to experiment and to have fun, but very much in the tradition of storytelling. And I think coming out of that, we've thought a lot about how do we move more towards a dialogical approach, where really uh, the conversations, the dialogues that happen on tours are where the interpretation uh, rises out. So as I mentioned earlier on, Jane Fee attended the Teaching and Museum Education in 2005, and she came back then from that experience, which was the very first time course, um, and did a presentation for the docents and the staff. And she shared what she had found most helpful in thinking about her tours. And so at that time, she encouraged docents to take more time, plan for fewer stops or fewer pieces. Um, she asked them to think about the types of questions we ask. Bridget and I were talking about earlier today. That's something that has um, evolved in Rika and Elliot's thinking over the years. Uh, in the first time, they really talked about how do you ask good questions. And now, of course, in the book, we question the use of questions. So uh, another point she made was um, 
to change places, change viewpoints often. Again, this is the advice she's giving to our docents. Uh, draw, sketch the works of art, and really expand your preparation. And I think that's something I was really struck by when I attended a few years later, the amount of preparation to really be um, deeply invested in the works of art, to, to take the time ourselves to, to spend with the art in the galleries. And she encouraged docents to do the same to not just go to the library or online to do a bunch of research, but to really engage deeply with the works of art in preparation for group tours. So when I attended in 2008, I came back and did some long looking with some member programs as well as a corporate creativity program I do. Uh, Bridget attended in 2009, and, and I'm sure she'll talk about that, and, attend, um, and then offered a course as well on long looking. I also have since started a Slow Art Saturday, where once a month we do long looking around a single work of art, again, open uh, as a drop-in program. But in 2011, when the book com came out, I was starting to take on more responsibility for training the docents in preparation for Barbara's retirement. And I started to infuse a little bit of this into the training. I assigned a couple of chapters, but I have yet to assign the whole book as a text for the docent class. And I think that's a question I have. I've talked to some of you about that. Uh, some people I know have started using this as a text, and I haven't done that just yet. I hope that comes up in our, our Q&A more. But one thing uh, that's really kind of wonderful this year is earlier in 2003, I bought more reader copies for the docent room, which is a library available to the docents. And I really encourage docents to look at the book and give me their thoughts on how they might like to use it, what they'd like to do with it. And out of that, invitation, uh, one of our docents, Susie Hanks, uh, came up with a proposal. And what she proposed is that she would organize a number of book study groups amongst the docents around the book. And that has happened. And it's happened really in a, an amazing way. She had, first of all, she had a huge response. Uh, 54 docents uh, have started this book study group. And it was five groups, so they're between eight and 12 apiece. And they have taken on the book just like any other book study group. They meet once a month, and they are going chapter by chapter. And the format is they take turns facilitating discussion of a chapter, and then also facilitating a close engagement with a work of art in the galleries. And the beautiful thing is, uh, I do drop in occasionally, but I'm really just a fly on the wall or a participant. They are absolutely um, taking lead on this. and what they give me as a gift in return is they type up all their notes and all their comments when I'm not there. So um, I have started to receive these wonderful, this wonderful record of docents' questions of the book, questions of the ideas, um, and then they're relating it to how they work in the galleries, their, their tours. So, and what's astounded me, um, and I know Chelsea and I talked about this as well after I shared the comments with her, is how similar their conversations are to ours. They have so many of the same questions and ideas. Um, you know, how do you balance the experience with the information sharing? How do you um, slow down? How do you take the time to do all this when the galleries are crowded and busy? How do you um, engage with different ages? You know, how do we do this with a, a five-year-old group versus an adult group? And these are exactly the conversations we've been having in the field. So I see this as a great opportunity to learn from them, uh, but I also see a big question mark, which is how do we start to align the conversations that we in our department are having as staff with those that our docents are having? I'm hopping a little bit between the two, but um, it's really taken on a, a wonderful life with the docents, and it's made me realize how much, like us, they appreciate the opportunity to build reflective practice and community, uh, peer learning amongst themselves. And with so many docents, uh, when we have a group as big as 180, it's critical for them to, to not just look to the staff for information and inspiration, but to look to each other. And, um, and also, it answers a big challenge of mine, which is how do you keep docents feeling inspired and engaged after many years? Which this book group has pulled some people out from um, quite a few years of experience who are starting to really want something different and new to do for their tours. So, um, and they're starting to apply a lot of the ideas on tour, which is amazing. And I think this had to come from a docent. I don't think it could have been staff driven, um, which is another interesting idea. If I, I think when I introduced the book, it was already feeling a little top down. 
And when this docent came forward and said, why don't we try this, it just, everyone really responded beautifully to that idea. So I think that um, in some ways it grew out of the group <laughs> instead of from, from the facilitator. And I guess lastly, before I turn it over to Bridget, I would just say, um, I think the other thing that's really struck me is that out of everyone in the building, it's our docents who get to have, in some ways, the most intimate and longest relationships with the works of art. Uh, I think I'm very envious sometimes of them. On staff, we have to, we have to make the time. And they do, too. They're, they're very busy. But as ambassadors of the art, they really are the ones who are most deeply uh, connected to the art. And they, in turn, are the ones who most importantly share that with our public and our visitors. So um, I, I just to find this a really exciting time, thinking about where we go next with this and how the docents will continue to use the book. They've just started. They're only on chapter three. Uh, so they're, they're planning it to go through the school year. And um, I hope by March for our presentation, I'll have a lot of good data and information to share. Uh, but I think I'll leave it there, there for, for now, now and then turn it over to Bridget to share more of her experience and the teen's experience on behalf of Chelsea. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, I, I first met Rika, I have to say, when I was at Bank Street in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, she just had a profound effect on how I think about my teaching and what I do. And it's been my goal, really, over the years to uh, let people know or, or just expose people to different ideas. Uh, docent, when I worked in Baltimore, Rika came to Baltimore and she's been here twice in Milwaukee. What's interesting for me is to think about how that change has happened over time. So I think one of the greatest things that happened was when um, Jane Fee slid into that first time <laughs> because her presentation uh, to the docent corps, as Amy said, just made a huge difference. And one of the last things she said in that was that docents should take the time to look and talk about art themselves and how important that first year of training is and how they get away from that afterwards. So I think her call to do that was very important. Uh, one of the times when Rika came, she asked us as a staff, what can you do with this in your own in your own work? You know, once I leave, and I, I remember writing saying that this is really why I came into the field. This is why it's really important to me. And then it dawned on me, like, oh, I could do this. I'm the director. Like, I could give myself time to do this. And so I did start teaching um, just twice a year, a long looking uh, class. Uh, four sessions an hour each. And I've been doing it for a few years now. Often there are docents in the class, and so it's an opportunity for them to see um, what happens when you really spend an extended length of time with a work of art, talking about it with other people. So um, I think then with Amy going to time and Chelsea going to time, people began to think about it in their own way and apply it in different ways which I think is really, really important, is that we look at it, because Jane's presentation to the docents was very different than anyone else would have done, and really looked at it as someone who deals with school groups in crowded places, as Amy had um, mentioned. Uh, what was great was uh, Chelsea was really inspired by Rika's visit and began to apply it to our teen program. And I'm here to talk about what she's doing with the teen program these days. So we have a satellite art uh, high school program. It's been in operation in various guises for 30 years. And uh, by the time Chelsea got here a few years ago, it was primarily a lecture program. Barbara Brownlee, who taught docents, loved teens. And she actually worked with um, uh, both groups. So uh, Chelsea was trying to think about um, how this long looking would really impact, or slow looking, would be adopted for teens. And she's done a couple of things that I think are really uh, interesting. Uh, the satellite teen program has been a semester long program. So for a semester, uh, each week she starts the week with an object study, which is looking at a single work of art for an hour using the dialogic method that's outlined in uh, Rika and Elliot's book um, that Amy had mentioned. In that chapter, there was a question about which is most helpful. That was a very helpful chapter, I know, for uh, Chelsea in thinking about it. 
Um, the final project is really where uh, the students uh, link the work of art with their personal connection to it, and they do an aesthetic response. Uh, it could be a painting, it could be a poem, it could be a song. And what Chelsea did last year was to begin to videotape those aesthetic responses with the students. And as a final project, there was a premiere night where uh, those uh, videos were shown. They're all on YouTube now. And uh, they pr were presented to uh, family and friends and teachers. And then there was a discussion. The teens were there to really answer questions. And one of the things that really came out about that was one of the questions from, I think, one of the parents was, you know, what would you tell another student? And um, one of the guys in the class, I tell this story often, um, said, I didn't know what I was missing until I came to this program, and talked about how his thinking about works of art changed so dramatically over that semester. Um, this year, um, the satellite program is a two-semester program, and Chelsea this year is asking students to uh, make the reflections on a video blog, so a blog that they uh, continue to work on every week that they're here. We um, have iPads for everyone that we got through a grant, and so each week they make a reflection. And she has some goals for them that's laid out. Um, and the first semester really focuses on their personal connection, and at the end of this first semester they'll edit, edit these blogs for sort of a midterm um, video and then present it to a group of um, other uh, museum staff, parents, teachers to really critique um, their thinking and help to extend their thinking about uh, their works of art. So they've taken a work, selected a work of art, they've looked at it individually, they've looked at it with a partner, and then each of them has to do a mini 15-minute uh, uh, object study with their classmates and then uh, continue to reflect um, with their vlog to see how their thinking changes over time and that's what we're really interested in seeing what happens. Um, also at the end of each uh, class she has an exit slip that's done on the video pad sharing something that they've learned and something that they're still wondering about every day. Um, there's a lot of power that comes through this, and I've seen these teens really engaged and look at a, a Rothko for an hour, and it goes from a, you know, an oversized uh, grand TV to really getting into the works of art, and it's just wonderful to watch. But some of their comments I just wanted to quote now. Um, one of the students said, I didn't really learn this, it was more like noticing, but I noticed that when we share our ideas with others. It's easier to see other possible perspectives on art and how and why and what art um, has meant and continues to mean today. Um, another student says, you know, you can look at a piece of art by yourself for an infinite amount of time and you still will never fully understand it. Uh, another student said, I find a new detail every time I look at a work of art. And many of them commented on how important it was to look at art with other people to be able to broaden their perspective and to think about it in different ways. So I, I'm really excited by what's happening uh, with the teens and how they are uh, really thinking about and sticking with looking at a work of art and I'm really excited to see what happens after a full year of living and studying and working and talking and thinking about one single work of art. So uh, we'll probably know more in, uh, in the spring at NAEA, but it's off to a pretty good start, I would say. Thank you. Amy? All right. I would, actually just adding to what you said, Bridget, I think the one of the things that those teen quotes point to that the docents have, already, always, have also uh, found so fulfilling is the idea that art is never exhausted. Right. And I think when I see docent fatigue and, uh, you know, sort of that weariness of having done the same tour over and over again, having gotten a little stuck in a rut, we all do it, with certain works in the collection, and thinking, um, you know, we have docents who've done this for 40 years, um, and some for a lot less, but even after five, ten years, you know, sort of where do you feel there's new discovery to be made for your own um, need to be own oh, oh, need to be fed, and um, and that I think 
some of those quotes from the teens, really, I see similar quotes in the docent group that they just are so feeling so fortunate to be back in the galleries with other people just as a regular person, not as a docent, but just as a person experiencing art with peers. And so that inexhaustibility of the art is what sort of refreshes them with the same collection they've worked with for 40 years. So anyway, I think um, at this point we'd really love to, I know we have some great questions coming up, and maybe we want to look to some of those, Michelle? So, so Julie, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, so, um, so thank you both for sharing many um, applications of how you're using teaching in the Art Museum, both with docents and tours, as well as with teens. And there's a lot of questions. Um, so if you're viewing this, just a reminder that you can type in questions um, that you would like um, Amy and Bridget to, to um, address. Also, you can click the plus one button if you see a question that's similar to yours, or if you have the same question and you'd like that to um, you, you can like it and it pushes it up in the queue. So just another thing to keep in mind. Um, so one of the questions that kind of rose up to the top is to what extent should art historical information be a part of the touring strategies in 21st century art museum education? Which is a huge question. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't, Amy, would you like to talk about that a little bit since you were talking about the docents and the tours? Sure. I think um, it's, a, it's a big question and it's big because it's really important and central to what a lot of us are thinking about is where does um, our historical information, where does it fall into our work and where, how do we use it um, to benefit and not to, um, to inspire great conversations, to have people learn things. Um, we were just talking about this with a group yesterday, with a group, another group of docents. I think I heard Rika say one time that information is like lightning and it has a lot of power and that power can ignite great discovery and it can also squelch um, people's looking or their, their open head where I've inserted information at a time that it really got people looking back at the art and so curious and asking more questions and, and noticing more things and I've given information at a time when they were so deeply involved in the experience that it sort of was like you know, dumping a pail of water, cold water on the experience. It's hard to describe. So information. Um, I think, you know, we, we're not an, a museum that uses VTS. I think we really do feel that what we've learned from history, what we've learned from researchers, and what we've learned from our own um, experiences with the works and our own study, that there's, um, that's all worthwhile. And it can really help us understand the work more completely. But it's not the only thing being used. And I think of chapter three, I know another question is about which chapters we find most relevant. And the docents have been just talking about chapter three, so it's top of mind, about the idea of guided interpretation. And where do you you guide them through some, some of the interpretation, but where do you yield to their observations? And so I'm not answering this clearly at all. It's really, I feel like, a balancing act. And every group I've had is different in what they are looking for. I think I more often ask my group after extended periods of conversation, is there something you'd like to know about the work of art? What would you like to ask the artist? What would you like to ask um, a curator? What would you like to ask me? And then that is, um, then it's curiosity driven. It's, that's motivating what bit of information is shared. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Bridget, if you want to add to that. Well, I would say that um, with the teens, there is a, an awful lot of research that the teens themselves do with that work of art. So in addition to um, sort of introducing different places people can do their own research, Chelsea does a packet of information about their work of art for each teen to sort of get them started. So I think it's a very, it's an important thing, but as Amy said, it's so, what's so interesting to me is when that's introduced, how it's introduced, and if it opens up the discussion or if it closes it. And believe me, I've done both and I've seen both happen. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is really, uh, continues to be, um, I mean, I think it's really interesting. For me, it's uh, chapter five is really um, an important chapter in the book that looks at conversation, discussion, mm -hmm. and dialogue. And I think if you read, um, the exchanges, each of those different exchanges, you can see, especially in the dialogic one, how much art history is really embedded in that discussion. Um, so it's so I think it's very important, I would say. Um, and I'm, I'm, I must say I'm pretty Catholic and with a small c in my uh, museum education strategies. So uh, 
I see a place for BTS and I've used it myself and I think um, what's great about our field is that there are these opportunities to test and try different things and I think uh, the work that Rika and Elliot done has really pushed us to continue to broaden our perspective on what we're doing so that's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question up here about do teens have the opportunity to guide discussions with each other um, and yes they do so Chelsea starts the semester really doing these object studies that she's leading but each of the students um, begins after that to do a 15 minute object study so it's shorter they lead the discussion but I think what's great about it is by that time the students are really comfortable with each other and they are not shy about talking so you have that um, sort of expectation built into the discussion that's there and I have to say I've just seen one of those in uh, my observations of uh, Chelsea's and the teens work and it was um, believe me they didn't hold back I'll say that <laughs> and had a lot of ideas and things that um, helped the team think about in different ways. Um, I could um, provide a link to the um, the vlogs are not online these uh, video um, uh, reflections but the um, the works that Chelsea did last year are online so it's students talking about um, their aesthetic response to works of art that is on YouTube if you just go to MAM um, it comes up on one of those but I can get a specific link. And did you say earlier, Bridget, when you were talking about the teens and using the vlogs as, um, I love this idea of the reflective practice where they can go back and reassess what, or not reassess, but just revisit what their initial ideas were or responses over time. Is that something that Chelsea has already started with the teens or is that something she's waiting till the end of the year or are they checking back throughout the year, do you know? They're checking back throughout the year and actually she's completed one full semester and so what they're doing now, um, I think they just finished this last week, was going back and reviewing all of their reflections and then editing it down to a big idea that they're really taking away and working with at this point. Mm -hmm. So I think that is her mid-year uh, video is what they're doing. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. But Great. it's nice for them to think about how their thinking has changed and how uh, many of them have talked about how looking at it with other students has broadened how they think about it as well, which is pretty great. It is. Okay, great. And then slightly connected to this, I'm just going to bump up this other question about the teen program is, um, but crucial, how is the teen program, quote, marketed to schools? Is there a common core piece that you have created that can be shared or... Is, it, is this team program connected to Common Core? Um, not in a very, not in a specific way. It's something that we market to teachers at high schools, um, and it's an application process so that the teen applies for it. There's a uh, phone interview, and then they're accepted into the program. Okay. So it's, it's really through teachers that we advertise it primarily. And is is Wisconsin one of the states that does do con Common Core? We do have Common Core, yes. Okay, I was just double checking. Yeah. Um, this is an after school program. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I guess kind of tangentially related to that, if um, I'm going to switch over to Amy really quickly, if um, Common Core and how that plays a role with thinking about this dialogical approach to, to teaching and working with the docents and preparing them to engage with the students of different ages? Oh, that's a good question. And I think. Um, you know, that's a piece, I've just sort of started to work back more with the schools. We sort of had docents and schools separated, which um, we're, we're coming back together and I'm working with our manager of school programs to um, think a little bit more about how those connect. And so I don't know that I have a very good answer for you, actually. Um, and that's part of the what I'm working towards for March is to uh, think more about that. Okay. Um, no, I mean, Common Core is still a new thing for a lot of us and just mm -hmm. thinking about what we have to offer. So I was just mm -hmm. curious about where, where yeah. that, what, what role that played in but you know, planning. Yes, well, and I, um, I think it hits on a bigger question, though, which is one of the things that we've talked about and the docents keep talking about is how do you, if teachers, what are teachers' expectations of the school visit? Mm -hmm. um, and if we have a multiple visit program where the, the visits are supposed to be very uniquely um, themed, one is about Wisconsin history, one is about American history, one is about world communities. And so when we want to have alignment with 
those um, places where they are in their curriculum, how does this fit with that? And um, I think it's, it's the blending of all these things. And it also makes me think of that question about where do we use art history information? I just had a docent yesterday who was, who was trying out the, the RICA approach, quote unquote, for the first time. And she kept saying, well, let's finish this part, and then I'll give you some information about the artist. And it was sort of this real separation in her first attempt, the idea that this is, first I'll do the RICA thing, and then I'll, I'll give art historical information afterwards. And, how, but, and we know from chapter five, from the dialogical approach, from chapter three, guided interpretation, that these things can all be blended. And, I, and I'd argue, of course, too, with um, two are that supposed to be about American history, absolutely, you can still be blending these things. And as Bridget said, we're not, be, we're not solely BTS. We're not, um, we like to, to pull from a lot of different sources. And I also am a big believer in that we teach who we are, and you have to teach authentically to who you are. And so each docent is going to, their teaching is going to look different, as just as each museum educator's teaching looks different. But sort of how do you bring all these things together? So mm -hmm. um, Common Core is part of that. OK. And that it's not either or, but it's yes and. Sure. Wherever that goes. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so then I'm just going to, uh, there's other question here since we're on the topic of docents still. Um, so just thinking about the, is there some type of mentorship program or are there mentors built in? Because you said you had 180 docents, which is, which is a lot. Um, so just the question of do you find the docents have different levels of understanding about how to approach a dialogue-based discussion? And if you have a mentorship program, do you find that that helps with that implementation? Uh, it does. We do have a mentorship program, so each new trainee is paired with a mentor for their training year, uh, but I encourage them to follow a lot of different docents and to connect to a lot of other people, again, to find who they, um, they we all pull from different people, bits and pieces, um, and to, again, teach authentically to who they are. But the, um, the interesting thing coming out of this book group is so many docents said we'd still like to find mentors in our work. We'd like to, to mentor each other more. And it's not a formal program anymore once you're beyond the first year. So I've been thinking a lot about that, too, is how do you provide for mentoring? A lot more docents now are showing up for my Slow Art Saturday, as I mentioned earlier, where I do once a month a Saturday morning long looking. And um, as more and more docents are reading the book, they've come to it, and they are just talking to me in different ways and then talking to each other in different ways, sort of as a, a new experience to see how dialogical um, learning and interpretation happens. And then, then they start to compare notes of how they can apply it to their tours. But I think with each class we have of the more recent classes where we, we see docents incorporating these ideas, and it started really with Jane Fee in 2005, and she also led some breakout groups. Um, you know, it's sort of more and more people are exposed to it, more and more people are trying it out, and I think that that um, increases the support for it. And um, But yes, everyone's at different comfort levels. It, it's only going to be, I think, um, interesting to you to try if you yourself have had a really great experience as a participant in a group. If you haven't had that yet, I mean, why would this be it's something to be interested in pursuing? Um, so you need to see it work, you need to feel it work yourself, or you need to um, have one of those transformative experiences that we're not supposed to teach to, but we all love when they happen. So, and then I guess a, a follow-up to that, I'm just curious, do you, um, is part of the goal for, and you might have addressed this previously, so I, I apologize if this is repetitive, but do you, is the goal for every, any type of tour that walks in the door that has a docent leading it to have a dialogical component to it, or does it depend on the audience? Um, we have not made that a clear goal. We've not okay. that above the door and on a plaque or anything. It's really, um, you know, our goal is really to connect people and works of art in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. And what that's going to look like with different groups is going to be different. Sure. Um, I think what we'd like to do is to see um, all the docents really exposed to these ideas have been, had the opportunity to participate in that type of experience and so that they can start to bring it into to more tours. I mean, I also do our public gallery talks for future exhibitions. And I've tried, sometimes it just, people are like, tell me what I want to know about this show. I really want to know. Uh, the art historical information, I really don't want to hear what this guy next to me has to say about it. And 
and I get that. I mean, I get that when you're seeing a feature exhibition, there's a certain amount of you want that big idea of the thesis of the show, and you want your information. You want your meat and potatoes. And um, so I try to infuse it in different ways. And I think the docents you know, have tried different experiments as well. But we don't have, I mean, I guess maybe Bridget should answer that as director of the department in her thinking about, um, we hope all of our tours are participatory. We hope they're comfortable. We sure. hope that all opinions are equally valued in the group. Um, but if it's a real dialogue-based dialogue, dialogue -based tour, that isn't always the case. I think it's really important. I think Amy's point that if you've experienced, um, you know, this uh, approach to looking at art with other people and experience really the magic of it, that is the biggest selling point. Mm -hmm. um, and really, my goal has been to provide as many opportunities as possible, um, bringing Rika out, but also having um, Jane uh, go to time and sharing with the docents the books being available, um, both Amy and I and Chelsea teaching using this. And I think the really important thing is that visitors know what they're getting into so that when they come and join the group, we talk, we say that it's slow looking, we say that it will take an hour and that it will be uh, a discussion and a talk with each other so that it's not like someone coming in for an express talk, you have 30 minutes and all of a sudden it's something that they don't expect at all. Mm -hmm. So I think if you set that expectation clearly, people know what they're entering into and they want and there's that desire to do that. Um, I think it's great that um, Amy's doing the Saturday um, slow looking and we do it during the week so that people have many opportunities to experience this. Um, there was a question about, uh, we share the book on the education department. We as a teaching team meet uh, monthly to really talk about our teaching and to experience different strategies in the galleries, which I think has been very helpful for all of us. And then each of us has really, um, I think, adapted this in different ways. And I expect that every docent will do that as well. So to me, what's really encouraging is that people are talking, they're reading about it, they're trying it. They're failing miserably. They're having <laughs> successes. It's like any tour, you know, when it goes really well, it's <laughs> walking on air, and when it bombs, it really bombs. <laughs> so that's uh, no different here either. And uh, but what I'm really excited about is the experimentation that's happening um, across all ages um, mm -hmm. with this method. Fantastic. And. Um, the other question we have is, how do you know how this is working? What type of are you, do you have any assessments in place to um, measure the dialogical teaching approach? Do That's you a good question too. Okay. I don't. I'm, now I have to think, Bridget. I can't think of. We certainly have evaluations that. So we have surveys that are sent to all teachers who come on a tour. We have surveys that are given to everyone who attends a class or a program. Um, so, but have we been able to tease out when it's a class that's absolutely a long looking class or a slow art looking class, then we, we see uh, feedback that's directed exactly towards that experience. So the dialogical teaching is what the class is about. So then we would have that feedback, which I'd say has been overwhelmingly positive. When it's a school tour um, survey, we don't have questions that really get to that yet. And that's a, an interesting th thing to think about. We certainly ask about the docent's ability to engage the students. We ask about the content of the tour, the pace of the tour. But we don't get more specific than that if the type of um, experience with more dialogue was what they were, uh, met their expectations or not. And then the effectiveness of it. We haven't done pre or post studies, unless I'm missing something, Bridget. No, I, we haven't done long-term studies on that. I would say the teens, um, there's an evaluation, and in all of them they talk about the object studies being the most important part of the program for them. And so um, it's that kind of, but I, we haven't done, um, I would say, a formal assessment beyond um, our regular evaluations. And I would say that for each of those, for the teens, um, there's not a teasing out to say it's this kind of, of looking. They would call it object studies or spending a long time with something or talking about a work of art that's most important to them. OK. Great. So I, I would say the other thing is, um, is the 
broadening range of objects that teens select and mm -hmm. to see how they're thinking about that has changed even over a semester. Um, there was uh, one year where uh, teens selected a work of art and um, this teen picked a bougaro on a whim and by the end of it was so into it that it just like amazed me and <laughs> Chelsea and everyone else. So, but those are not, you know, that kind of formal evaluation. Mm -hmm. It's just great stuff. <laughs> and, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, Michelle, I, was, I didn't know if you had other questions, otherwise I was, um, I had one other thought, but it's not sure. related to... to no, go to, ahead. To, go to ahead. Share that. Okay. Well, it goes back to the question about which chapters are, we feel maybe most helpful to docents. And I'd say the one that I've used, I mentioned in docent training that I've um, talked about um, certain chapters with the class, but I haven't assigned the whole book. And I'd say one chapter that I find works really well with docents is the questioning the use of questions, which is mm -hmm. chapter six. And because that, you sort of step back from the idea of long looking or slow looking, um, and just why do we ask questions? And what's the purpose of questions? What types of questions are we asking? And um, so many of the docents in the book study groups have said when they've tried to use the idea of um, repeating back what they hear, paraphrasing and affirming what's heard in the group, they don't have to use questions anymore because the group just keeps building on it. It's sort of so many years, in the first years when I was here, there was such um, emphasis in our school materials about how to ask the right questions. And so that is a chapter I think you can really jump into with the docent group right away and just think about what are questions, why we ask them, and, um, and, and try going without questions on a tour. It's a simple thing to try. And I think a lot of docents have found that really they just come back elated with how much the group continues talking and sharing opinions and ideas and observations without the use of a question. And so it's like you, you can exhale and forget you have to all, you're supposed to remember all these types of questions to ask. Um, and you just really, then you're more in the dialogue mode. And so I think that's a, a stepping stone to more of the other ideas in the book. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just wanted to share that because I'm doing it on Thursday with the docents questioning the use of questions. So top of mind. I think the other thing I was thinking back about when Jane came uh, from time and talked to the docents, you know, she was really coming from her perspective. So, you know, often docents who are new in the program tend to try to cram in more works of art than maybe um, than we would recommend on a tour. So, you know, if we say, you know, five stops or five objects or something, you know, a dose, Jane said, you know, I was doing 20 when I first got in the program because I just thought I had to keep moving and keep moving. So her takeaway from time was to slow down. And for her, that meant five stops, you know, and that was a big change for that. So I think also change is incremental is what I want to say. And, mm -hmm. and for questioning, and, you know, she said, why don't you turn the question around and have kids ask questions about works of art? And so she does this thing with um, with some sculpture that says, "What would you ask that person? You know, if a Roman bust, what would you ask them, and what would they be asking you?" So she kind of thought about them in different ways. And what I was struck by is how she didn't try to just copy, but really thought about what does this mean and how I now give tours, and what are subtle, slight changes that I can make that would improve what I'm doing on my tours. And so I would encourage, that that's kind of the beauty of it being docent-led in a way, and, and assuming that all of us, whether staff or docents or our audiences, are thinking individuals and take things in and sort of um, think about them in our own unique way. And I would encourage that mm -hmm. across the board. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we have one last question, which is um, just as a staff or also with these audiences that you've been mentioning, what other books or resources do you use to inform your practice? You've both been talking a lot about trying different teaching methods and finding what works, both for your own, like your program goals, but also for the audience. And so wondering if there are other books that are um, I don't know. I think a lot of us have like a wide variety of books, whether they're things that are similar or totally different or coming from different fields. And I think there, there's a lot of informal as well as formal book clubs that are going around in the museum education fields. So I think some colleagues are just looking for what other types of, of things that are um, that you're finding useful right now. 
Do you want to go first, Bridget? I have a couple of no. <laughs> I'm stuck in meetings all day. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, to read more books. Um, uh, well, it's interesting because the two that came to mind really are not, um, well, the first one is really not a museum education That's book. That's okay. But it's a book that has had such an impact on my life this last year, and a lot of you may have read it. It's um, the book Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Mm -hmm. And why I think about that is um, I think something that I really took away, and, and Rika and Elliot, if they even remember me from time, would know I was one of the quietest people in the group. I, I tend to be quite quiet. I um, tend to be um, a silent participant, and I have learned so much from that book of the idea that so many people, when people are not speaking out a lot and they're not really actively engaged in the dialogue, that doesn't mean they're not participating. And so I think just trying to be aware of others in the group, um, and I have that in every docent class. I have docents who are very quiet through training, but then they come to me afterwards and they really share a lot of what they're getting out of it. So the whole idea of dialogue-based um, implies that everyone is talking a lot. Um, but sort of where where is that silent internal dialogue happening? And so I think that is something I just think a lot about. Um, and of course, I'm projecting my my own uh, therapy into the discussion, I guess. But <laughs> the um, and the other book, which I, I went to Bank Street. I finished that program a year ago. And when we had the class with Lois Silverman and the social work of museums, was a really profound book for me as well. And the idea that museums are places. Um, and now we have an artist therapy book that just came out, which I'll be curious to read. And the idea of museums or artwork as um, a way to really to just explore the human condition and a place for groups of all types of groups, groups to come together and have these really powerful experiences that can only happen in these third places that aren't our homes and our schools and our work. So, um, so none of those are really sort of teaching books, but they're books that I have found inspiring lately. Okay, there great. You go. Anything come to mind for you, Bridget? Well, I, I think this is a not a, a not teaching um, book, but it's a photographer, Cortez, who did a book on a uh, book of photographs on uh, reading, and there are people reading in all different places, and and um, I often think about that when I think about looking at works of art because I think people come in and look at it in so many different ways, and it's the beauty of that sort of. Uh, range of looking that I think is so exciting to me. So the other books that come to mind is David Carr's book um, on museums. George Hines had a big impact on me. Maxine Green, you know, there's um, some great books that are out there and people's reflections on uh, teaching in museums. Okay, great. Well, I want we're drawing to a close with our time here, so I want to thank both Bridget and Amy for sharing your perspectives very much. Um, it's really helpful just to get the um, get the dialogue going about dialogical teaching and how we approach it. So thank you both so much. And this is part of this is in, in a way a preparation for a session that. Amy and her colleague Chelsea are, are um, going to set, lead a session about an NAEA convention coming up in March. And I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Amy, before we draw sure. to a close. Well, and, conceived, well, you'll have to, to come in March, and we really hope you will. Uh, we conceived today of Bridget, or Chelsea and I were going to present, and Bridget was going to be our fresh perspective. Um, so Chelsea and I had prepared our parts, and so I really want to say thank you, Bridget, for jumping in and with Chelsea being out. But I think as we look ahead to that March presentation, any of you who want to reach out by email or phone, um, please do. We'd love to hear your questions or what you've been trying. I think we want to get a sense of what else is happening in the field, and I know that's a little tricky to do with um, the Q&A. But please do reach out. We'd love to um, have a chance to respond to that and connect with you as well. OK. Great. Well, thank you again, everyone, for participating in a peer-to-peer -peer hangout today. We hope that this provided some insights and gave you some uh, food for thought, as well as thinking about questions and implications for your own teaching and practice. Just a reminder that we have four more hangouts coming up. The next one is Friday, um, this coming Friday, and it's with, um, I believe it's December 6th, and that's with Mark Mark Osterman from Miami. So today we focused in the Midwest, and now we're going down to uh, the southeast and Mark will be talking about docents and uh, professionalizing the practice as well as thinking about mentorship. Um, so I hope that you join us. That'll be at 1 o'clock 
p.m. Eastern time on Friday. And uh, please continue to refer to the NAEA Museum Education Division uh, Google Plus page. We have all of our upcoming events listed there. If you'd like to keep the conversation going, particularly about this Hangout or other topics that you think would be of interest, please um, join that page and submit your questions and share your ideas. And these series of Hangouts are just the beginning of setting up a, a more formalized schedule. If you're interested in hanging out and sharing ideas with your peers, uh, please um, like I said, post ideas there. You can contact me directly. My contact information is available on that page. And um, we hope to see you again at a future peer-to-peer -peer hangout. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Sure.